Hey channel, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Today I've got one of my favorite brands here at the shop. This is um, a PA3100HV from T plus A. T plus A is a, a European brand that we've carried here now for a few years and we're absolutely in love with it. Um, and this is my favorite piece when they're in the lineup. This is the 3100HV integrated amplifier which has a, a few unique features that we really haven't seen in the market. It's got an incredible attention to detail, um, build quality, and engineering behind it, worthy of a video of its own. Uh, I don't do a lot of these sort of uh, new product review videos, but when I come across something special, I try to grab it and, and run with it. So here we are. I'm going to spend, in this video, probably about 30 minutes, we're going to look inside the unit, outside the connections, the upgrades available, and why this is uh, uh, worth noting. Um, so hang in there, as I mentioned, 30 minutes or so, and we'll dive right in. So the HV series sits at the top of the T plus A lineup. Um, and HV stands for high voltage, and I'll go a bit more into that later in the video. Um, there are some complementary components to this. You can buy uh, an HV a uh, dedicated amplifier, a streamer, a streamer CD player, a preamp, etc. So it's a full lineup of these uh, HV models. Um, they're all about the same form factor except for the monoblock amplifiers, which are pretty unique on their own. Um, so I encourage you to visit T plus A on their website to see the full lineup under the HV series. So high voltage is what HV stands for and um, the story behind it, or at least the marketing story behind it, is that the engineers at T plus A uh, loved uh, the tube equipment so much that they set out to figure out what about it made it so special. Uh, and they decided that it was the fact that it runs on high voltage. We see some rail voltage on two amps here in the shop exceeding three, 400 volts. Uh, and that's apps, what they're claiming to be what makes them sound special. Um, I'm sure the truth lies somewhere in between that and a few other factors about tubes in particular that make them sound special. But certainly the high voltage could be one of the driving deciding factors. So at three or 400 volts, some stuff happens that doesn't happen at lower voltages, right? They're claiming that the frequency response is much flatter and linear throughout the frequency range uh, at those voltages. So um, in order to get that out of a solid state amplifier, they had a pretty tall order in place. They had to figure out how to get transistors and, and, and output devices that would operate in such crazy voltages. And they did, and they did with, um, with great attention to detail and some great expense. Um, it takes quite a bit to design and implement an amplifier of this design. And that's why people generally haven't done this. This is an expensive piece, you know, retailing somewhere around the $25,000 mark. But it is an integrated amplifier and that brings you a ton of features, a ton of options. And in this video, I'm gonna try to make some sense out of why it may be justifiable to spend this kind of money on an integrated rather than separates. I'm also going to talk a bit about the options for this, which are some unusual options. There is, in fact, a power supply you can get for this that will connect to the back of it. So over here in the back, we've got a, this high voltage connection port that allows you to utilize a, uh, an outboard power supply. Um, it's called the PS3000HV. Retailing at $16,000, I'm going to try to tell you why at some point a power supply will, uh, will make some, some upgrade sense to this piece a bit later in the video. Uh, other options for this piece include a, a moving magnet and moving coil um, phonocards, which is really a must nowadays. So I'm glad they did, in fact, uh, offer it as an option. So you're not paying for it unless you actually want to use it. I like to see that. And also a signal processor in case you want more equalization and control of the output. And that is a $3,200 option. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned the moving magnet and moving coil is a $1,700 option. You choose between the two, you don't get both. So why an, why an upgraded power supply? Well, the first thing it does, it gives you almost two times the res, uh, reserve power storage or capacity. So you're able to deliver a much higher current through the use of an external power supply. And what happens internally when you connect an external power supply is that the internal power supply drives the input stages 
and some of the logic in the unit, and then the external power supply is dedicated to just the output stage. So uh, if you've got a difficult, difficult speaker load, it would actually make some sense, rather than go to a separate amplifier. Uh, and that's a typical upgrade path, right? As you buy an integrated amplifier, use it as far as you can, and then one day you decide you need a little bit more oomph, so you bypass the amplifier section inside of the integrated, and you go to an external power supply. And that's a bummer, because you end up leaving a ton of the circuitry unused inside of the integrated. So T plus A's, upgrade path that actually makes great sense. So the internal power supply is still in utilis utilized and uh, for the more delicate side of the business and then the external power supply with its huge reservoir capacity is used for the output stages and that's just about right. Uh, total um, capacitance for example is 120,000 microfarads for the unit itself which is pretty impressive to begin with. So. Uh, the power rating at this level here, and it doesn't change throughout the upgrade path, is about at 4 ohms, this the thing's capable of about 300 watts. I'm sorry, at 8 ohms, it's capable of 300 watts and peak up to 380. And at 4 ohms, it's 500 watts with peak up to 700. Before we dive in, let's look at the connections on the back because there's lots happening here. Uh, starting with the easiest, the speaker outputs, we've got um, A and B. Uh, speakers which are selectable through the front. These are really cool wing nut uh, design which don't require wrenches and it will take a banana or a spade or bare wire if you ever choose to. So essentially uh, speak rate outputs A and B. Um, 20 amp power cord necessary for the amount of current that this thing utilizes. On the other end of this it is conventional plug so don't be thrown off by this type. Um, LAN is a connection to the network um, and this H-Link is a connection to other T plus A pieces so they can kind of be aware of each other. Um, and then we've got a uh, balanced and single ended for just about everything, um, starting at the ends and um, we've got pre-amplifier outputs in RCA and XLR. Now one of the indications of a dual mono design is generally the layout for the back panel. If you sort of draw a line down the middle uh, with exception of the power cord, you generally will have a mirror image of each other. So we've got a pre-amplifier output here for the right channel, and all the way over here we've got it for the left channel. So this is, in fact, a layout indicative of a dual mono design. Um, going through it, we've got inputs, uh, 4, 3, 2, 1 for the right channel, and then same thing for the left channel. And then single sets of RCAs for a little less important stuff, like a recorder and an output. Love to see this here. Uh, we sell a lot of reel-to-reel -reel machines or tape decks, so we love to see a recorder in and out, which is missing from a lot of pieces nowadays. Uh, we've got this in 5, which is essentially reserved for the use of the phono, and then in 6 here, the uh, sixth input in there. So tons of stuff happening here and just about everything you'd want. And then we talked about this earlier. This is the connection for the external power supply. This is a high-voltage, very high-quality mil-spec type of connector. Now this amp is in fact a dual mono design and we'll confirm that when we look inside. We're also going to be looking out for the differential cast code um, JFETs on the output stage. Um, they also claim they use discrete uh, construction, no op amps throughout the unit and that'll be interesting and unusual for something of this level. Um, so all this effort essentially is to try to get um, you know some sort of sound characteristic that does not change throughout the frequency range and that's a tough, tall order. Um, so hopefully um, that's what this sort of high voltage um, output stage will do for us. Um, now we're not gonna be able to measure that, or at least not within the scope of this video, but we'll certainly take a look inside and see what kind of topology they used and, and trickery to get to that point. Now it is a, a beautiful unit. It's, it feels like it's built out of a solid block of aluminum, and it is 38 kilograms, which is a very heavy piece. Um, now it comes in two colors. You can get in this Titan silver or, or Titan, tit sorry, titanium finish, which is what we've got here. And it's also available in a silver, which, um, you know, one or the other may complement your system a bit better. So I'd, I would pick based on that. Some pretty heavy heat sinks throughout the unit. And I suspect the entire case acts as a heat sink because it is pretty thick and in, in, uh, in gauge. 
Operation of the unit is pretty simple and straightforward. The most difficult thing about it is actually finding the power switch. It is not what you expect. You expect a push of one of these large buttons or um, some sort of toggle switch. If you see, there's a faint outline here of a power switch. So this is a, a touch sensitive power button. That brings it out of standby into operation. Uh, while these things are blinking, as so you can see here, uh, the thing is booting up. So um, to access, there are three sort of areas for menus um, that you need to know about. One is access by holding the power button, I'm sorry, the volume button. Uh, a long push there gives you access to things like uh, selecting your speaker outputs. Uh, let me see if I can get a better shot for you, that glare. So um, selecting a B output for the speakers, turning the headphone jack on and off, and uh, the tape monitor, as well as balance. So fairly straightforward. A secondary push gets you into that mode. So if I go to balance, I do a second push. Now I can go left and right. Pretty intuitive in there. Now the um, a long press and hold gets you back out of it. Now on the left side, on this button here, it's just to uh, toggle. Let's see if we're there. If we do a long hold here, it turns on the monitor. And then a long hold turns it off. Um, another thing to note is this is the setup button that gets you into a deeper menu, but there aren't a lot of things. It's not overwhelming in any sense. Uh, we can name uh, and disable um, the inputs. Uh, we can, uh, here's the, the ability to, to rename them. The by wiring mode is very interesting. The outputs on the back are configurable. <clears throat> for either A-B operation, in case you have two sets of speakers, or if you are going to buy wire to a speaker, you can activate them both all the time, and that's what's done, toggled right here in this menu. Uh, number four is the display VU meter, whether you want it on or off. This is in case you've got a, maybe a dark room and you don't want the, the bright uh, LEDs disturbing you. Brightness, uh, the ability to display, um, dim the entire display. So that's both the upper and lower section. Uh, display mode, whether you want this to be always on or always off or temporarily, meaning it's gonna time out. So I'm gonna keep it out always on. Volume mode, this is to check between, to select between steps and dBs. Steps will give you a zero to 100. And dBs will give you the entire volume range, but it measured in dBs. I've got it set to steps. Um, volume after power on, this is a nice thing. This is essentially like when you first power on the unit, what you want the volume to be, whether you want it to be what you had at last or some sort of safe setting, which is what I like it to be at. So I would probably change this over to limited um, and pick something low, just so you don't damage any equipment. Uh, language is English. Um, energy savers off, and that's a nice thing to have this easy access to because they're generally buried deep you know, or have some magic button push to disable the energy saving. <clears throat> so that's what's gonna turn off the unit after a certain time of inactivity. Uh, network is to connect us to um, the computer network for updates and other sort of firmware uh, revisions. And then the device info is gonna tell you what sort of version every piece of software that runs this unit is on. So pretty straightforward, uh, getting out a menu, uh, you just select the uh, setup button again. And of course, I'd, I didn't talk about it, but this left button clearly labeled source, scrolls through the sources and you can hear the relays clicking in the back and the volume is on this side. I'm talking about the remote, nothing surprising here. Uh, it is a multifunction remote, so it can control other T plus A units. Uh, but um, things I like to see on a remote is access to the, ba the balance and that is here at the audio, which is great. That's the, one of the few things you need to do from your seat. Um, and then direct source input, which is great. So we've got all seven inputs with a single button direct access to it. And uh, a mute, which you can clearly hear the relays clicking when we mute and unmute the unit, which I don't see on the front panel. I might have missed it, but I don't really see the, or I don't get the same 
results or click. Actually, that turns off the speakers. That's not the mute button, as you can see here. So I guess effectively it's a mute, but you're actually just disabling the speaker outputs so as you can hear them click. Now the fun part, let's look inside. Now getting into these things is becoming harder and harder each year. Um, every manufacturer has a new clever way of, of essentially managing the cabinet work. I think I get a sense of what we need to do here. These two look suspicious with their with their captive washers in there. So let me crack those and see. I'm gonna guess it at two and a half mil. Okay. So let's put these safely aside somewhere. Sure enough, that's the way in, at least to the top. Let's see what we got here. I imagine to get further in, we'll have to remove something from the bottom so the sides come off. That's pretty interesting. The heat sinks are probably attached, and I'm going to guess this piece here, the sort of clamshell design, will come off in one piece. But looking here, um, first thing we see is obviously all the, the vertically mounted circuit board for the RCS and XLR so all the connections are direct to a PC board which we like to see rather than having wires <coughs> and um, we see a power supply stage up here a bunch of resistors I think I know what they're going to be for and I suspect those are transistors so they talk a lot about um, they do talk a lot about the resist resistive volume network implementation which is interesting they're using essentially relays and resistors to attenuate the volume and I suspect that's what we've got up here is the actual um, board for managing the volume tons of resistors here precision film resistors and a bunch of relays I'm gonna look up this number and confirm there are in fact relays they talk in the literature about having uh, essentially gas sealed um, relays with gold contacts um, so those may be it. I'm going to count them. They seem to be two, four, six, seven per side. Um, and then we've got a power supply stage here at the back of it and another one here at the front. So make note of the quality of the components here. We've got WEMA uh, capacitors throughout the audio path. Um, I see Samwa capacitors here and a mix up front um, and then all the precision resistors throughout the other thing worth noting here sorry about all the noise at this turntable that I'm on is and the other thing worth noting is the values of some of these capacitors I see here uh, 450 volts, um, unusual for an amplifier, uh, 250 volts on these, and this ones here are 400 and no, 50 watt, where did I see, I thought I saw some four, some were 400 volts, yeah here, 450 volts for those guys. So I imagine that's part of the high voltage topology they're talking about. I also see some distress here, and it's mostly cosmetic, but you see on this capacitor here that the, the shrink wrap has failed or shrank, uh, and the tops of these have come off. Um, it's a common, it's not a failure point, but it's a common cosmetic issue when some of these caps are mounted very close to the voltage regulators. Here, the heat sinks will just essentially shrink the, the wrapping around it. It doesn't mean it's going to fail, and it doesn't mean it's precarious. It's just uh, something we like to see neat and tight throughout its lifespan. Another cool thing to note here is how they're managing temperatures. So the case here is not vented. Uh, if you saw, I removed the glass top from it. It's essentially a solid piece of aluminum with a piece of glass inserted into it. So the way they're managing heat out of this entire power supply stage is through these extensions from the heat sinks. So these are connected to a larger heat sink here in the front, which I suspect connects in turn to the side fans. But if you follow 
the curvature of these. They come down here and then connect to this chunk of aluminum here. So interesting way of getting heat away from the top of this unit. And uh, these are essentially just relying on those heat sinks. They're not really being vented anywhere. Another thing is the this plate of aluminum that is sitting here seems to have some sort of coating on it. I'd love to know what that is. But it, what they're doing here is essentially trying to isolate magnetically for interference the output or the the delicate signals from the least delicate signals. So you're essentially uh, some sort of shielding here uh, vertically separating the two. All right, so I've powered on the unit to confirm the volt, uh, the volume operation. And sure enough, um, as I scroll through the volume here, you can see we're in the 50s now, you hear a kind of uneven pattern of clicks. Um, and yes, if I get close enough to this without killing myself from the high voltage, you can kind of get a sense that these relays are activating, but they're activating at sort of at different rates. Um, so what I think it's happening is they've got a, a value of resistors here, a varying value, and the relays come in and out of engagement. Maybe some, uh, uh, maybe sometimes you could engage one or two relays in order to get the correct volume or resistance through the network. So really ingenious um, and fairly quick as well. And what's even nicer is you don't hear any pop or anything from it. So kudos for to T plus A for for designing and implementing such a nice volume section on this. All right, now we've got this thing flipped over. It's quite an ordeal to flip it over at 38 kilograms, but beautiful case work at the bottom as well. This is where manufacturers usually cheap out. They don't bother putting any effort into the bottom case work. But look at this. Uh, we've got the end caps, which got to be about three quarters of an inch. Uh, and the same sort of sliding bottom plate as we did. So a couple of screws gives us access. And again, this is super high voltage stuff, guys. So let me take all the risk here uh, and don't be tempted to open your unit. All right, so a few things uh, that are notable here. Uh, I've been mentioning a few times in this video about its dual mono construction. Well, I was totally wrong. Uh, the amplifier section has a single toroidal transformer for both left and right channels, not uncommon, but um, I want to make sure to make that correction in the video. Massive toroidal transformer. Look at this thing, absolutely beautiful. 1,000 volt ampere uh, encased in some sort of ferrous material or, or aluminum. Can't really tell what that is. And it is potted and beautifully laid out, but the size is absolutely stunning. Um, here we see the, um, the eight output transistors per side. Um, now we've measured voltages here and they're conventional um, 70 volts uh, at the rails. So the amplification section is, is conventional voltage. There's nothing really magical about it. Here we see a couple other things, some soft start relays, uh, the capacitor banks per side. Uh, I think their literature states it's 12,000 microfarads per side. Um, and then, oh no, total, right? So that would be 246. Yeah, these are 100 or a thousand microfarads each. So here we've got a, a complement of 12 and that's where they get to the 12,000. Uh, a couple of fuses in there. Uh, this is a module to control the trigger. Um, nothing really remarkable in here, but you get a kind of a better look at the chassis, which is really an interesting part of the design here and where they uh, spared no expense in here. And I found a picture, I think it's common to all the amplifiers. So if we look at, let me look back at the, the literature for the amplifier has this sort of sneak peek at what the internal skeleton looks like and it's pretty impressive. Um, super heavy gauge aluminum uh, where everything is mounted to. So uh, the turtle transformer and all the heat sinks and circuit boards are mounted to this internal to the case. So pretty cool piece. Oh, by the way, this is their amplifier. Another amazing piece, the 3000 HV. Um, which is essentially a variation of what we're looking at now. All right, not much else to report here. Um, pretty good layout. Um, all the control circuitry must be on the front panel. I see, for example, the Ethernet port here that comes in from here goes through an actual Ethernet jumping cable to the front of the of the unit. So I imagine all the logic and the noisy bits are housed in the front panel, which is a, a great design idea. 
few more observations on the preamp stage. Um, the layout here um, is beginning to make sense. So as we got the volume control section here, this is probably the power supply for the volume control. And you do see some um, IC chips in here for the logic, which is probably fairly complex in terms of activating all these relays to get the proper volume. And then this is the preamp stage here, the high voltage, you know, where the magic happens for T plus A. Um, and so that's why we've got uh, all these high rated capacitors and uh, heat sinks along with it. Uh, the last thing to note, I think this is probably the these pins that you see here are for the phono cards or the EQ cards. I'm not quite sure. I'll check with T plus A on that, but it would make sense that they would be located here in the on the preamp side of the board. I don't see much room elsewhere. Although between here and here, I do see uh, a multi-pin connector. So perhaps the phono card slots into this spot right here. That's probably more logical. Now the first concern with the volume design of this nature is obviously the reliability of the relays, but I assure you at this point they've sorted that out. These are uh, probably very high quality resistors. They are in fact um, um, sealed to the elements, so there's no chance of any sort of corrosion error or, or deterioration of the gold contacts. Um, so I wouldn't really be concerned with that. And they're also carrying a very low voltage signal. Uh, even though we're talked about high voltage throughout, uh, the signal path is, is low voltage as it would be in a conventional amplifier. So um, I suspect this, uh, this will be a super reliable um, volume system. Here's a close up of the relay that I took before. It's also, I noticed uh, the type that they use on the um, input selection. Um, board. Uh, so same relays on both volume control and uh, the input selection. Since those re relays are a critical part of the design, I thought I'd take a closer look at a spec sheet. So they're Axicom um, signal relays uh, and the spec sheet uh, confirms a few things. Um, you know, the configuration, the plating used on the relays, on the contact points. It's a signal relay, so it's the appropriate type of relay to use in these sort of like low voltage applications. The coolest thing about it is that it comes in a uh, bistable format, which is essentially a latching relay. And you can see it right here. Uh, so rather than continuously provide power to this relay to maintain the volume, they actually just invert the, the voltage on it to get it to flip from one state to the other. And that's why we hear all that clicking. Um, and how they are able to maintain it super, super quiet is because they're not energized all the time. So cool design on that. All right, now let's take a look at the lineup because it can be a bit confusing. So I'm going to focus just on the HV series from T plus A. Um, there are quite a few boxes and I'll go through each one of them. Um, the first three to kind of identify are the reference pieces, right? So the SD3100HV, which is a reference streaming DAC. Uh, and then to the right of it, the SDV3100HV, which is a reference streaming DAC preamp. So very similar functions. The one on the right adds the preamp uh, functionality. And then the other reference piece, the third one is the PDT3100HV, which is a SACD slash CD reference transport. Um, so that's these three guys here. Now the rest of it is fairly straightforward once you kind of, you know, put those three aside. You've got um, the, the PSD 3100 HV, which is the preamp streaming DAC, uh, the integrated amp that we just went over through today. Then we've got a multi-source SACD player, and then the preamp uh, in the 3000 format, the preamp in the 3100, um, the 3000 amplifier, and then the power supply that goes um, with the integrated amp from today. So that's pretty much the lineup. Um, now we've got a video that I did a year or two ago on the streaming DAC. Uh, the, so I'll put a link to that below. It's worth a watch because really this integrated amp with that uh, streaming DAC is um, a really great setup, a two piece setup. And the other thing to notice, I didn't note until just now that there is in fact uh, individual program where you can pick the color that you want your unit. So you've got a, some sort of cool decor like here. <clears throat> you can pick any color you want or um, you can work with, with a dealer like us to, to figure out 
the best. I forgot to mention one of my favorite products from T plus A, which is the M40 mono amplifier. Uh, you can see it here. So who's this model for, the PA3100HV? I think it's for essentially a consumer that wants an uncompromising execution of an integrated in a very simple package, right? There's a lot in this box. We've got a, a award-winning pre-amplifier, a fabulous amplifier, uh, and the ability to do phono, as well as some DSP functionality, all in one box. The convenience is just tremendous. So if you've got a, a decor where you don't want a bunch of boxes sitting out in the open, you just kind of want a simple, elegant solution, but you don't want to sacrifice a single thing, this is probably a, a good piece for you. Um, it also provides a really nice upgrade path. Um, so you can then down the road, a few years later, if you decide, you know what, I want this to turn in the system into my primary system and I want absolutely the best of the best, you can go ahead and, and add a power supply to this. You can, you know, go into a bi-amp setup, you know, by bringing in a separate power amplifier, um, a network streaming DAC, lots of great upgrade paths from that point on. So this will really never become obsolete in that sense. There's no streaming functionality or any of the stuff that's going to get outdated. This is a piece that's going to be around for a long time without ever needing to be upgraded or anything that has evolved. And you know, if you, if you listen to this channel before, you know I'm, 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 I don't like spending a ton of money on stuff that's going to be outdated in five to ten years. So the fact that this is not an, a streaming integrated amplifier or offer any of the streaming functionality is actually a plus for it. So here you have it, the MP3100. If you are interested in this piece or anything else from T plus A, please contact us at skyfiaudio.com. We are dealers for this brand. It's one of the few brands that we represent here in the U.S. And we do it because we are passionate about it and we love it. So please subscribe and like if you like this video. And um, we also have a newsletter that goes out every Friday with all the recent arrivals. And you, I'll put a link to that in the description below so it's easy for you to get to. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed making this video for you. And I'll see you soon.